Well, good morning. Welcome. Let's go ahead and stand and sing uh, page 363, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Leaning on Jesus. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. You praise duet this morning, I'm telling you. What a good way to start things off in all of the world's upheaval. The solution is to lean on the everlasting arms of Jesus. Amen. He'll never leave you. He'll never let you down. He'll never disappoint you. I promise you that. Good morning to you. Good morning. Everybody getting ready for the big holiday this week, right? We went on diets and lost one ounce so we could pig out this week or something like that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you chose to worship with us at Victory this morning. We come for one purpose, and that's to exalt the name of Jesus. Our call to worship is found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Would you say it out loud with me in unison this morning? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and the Father by Him. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. That kind of encapsulates it right there, doesn't it? Before we go further, let's pray and ask God's blessing, His presence this morning and this hour. While our heads are bowed today, Brother Barry Bostador, would you lead us in prayer, please? Would you remain standing as Adam and Ashley lead us this morning in that old song down at the cross where my Savior died? Sing it out this morning, would you please? Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of Glory to His name. I am 
so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within, there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of mine. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul Thank you, maybe seated this morning. Thank you so much today. I just wanted to kind of catch you up on some of the things we're doing and have been doing this week leading up to Thanksgiving. Your faithful attendance, your faithful giving has made it all possible. This past week, we worked in conjunction with the Kingston Police Department and seven other area local churches to help put together food boxes to help folks with Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, there were 500 of those total that we had a part in. You bought the taters for them. You got to have taters at Thanksgiving, don't you? Now, I think there was some icing for the cake that would go along with the cake mix that some other church bought. But uh, so we got icing on the cake and taters because you folks have been so... What else do you need for Thanksgiving dinner? I'm telling you. And uh, so you're very kind to help out. We individually here gave out about 30 boxes, I believe, or 15, I'm sorry, I doubled that. 15 boxes, but because of your faithful giving, we're able to do those kind of things and locally reaching out to the community. Another thing we've done is get the shoe boxes gone. You raised the money, came in, and so we were able to ship all record number 331. I've been saying 330. Lisa reminds me it's 331 because you were so generous and loving to help kids at Christmas and we're able to get all of those shipped out and they'll get those by the holidays. And we're so glad for that. And then locally, we work with Operation Reach. We give a financial contribution there as they help uh, area children have a Christmas that might not have a very good one otherwise. And so we're so glad that we can reach out to the community. We send missionaries around the world. And we not only do that, but we also minister to our local community because of your faithfulness in giving. Some of you go online and give. Some bring the offering by the office. Others drop it in the receptacles. There's one at each door as you leave, an offering box that you can drop your offering in today and help us carry on the ministry that God has given us here at Victory Baptist Church. That's what makes it all possible this morning. Well, I hope again as you've had a good week, and I know uh, lately things have been in an upheaval, and they've been that way for a while and probably will be. hate to be a pessimist. But it's so good to know that God's still on the throne, right? He's still sovereign. He hasn't abdicated. He hasn't thrown up his hands in disgust and said, Well, I hadn't planned on this. So I'm glad that God's still over all this morning. Let's have a time of prayer together as a church family. But before we do that, maybe you have a special request on your heart. Do remember Sandra Shelton, whose grandbaby died this past week. And they, she has uh, been able to, they, the family has been able to donate organs to help other young people. And I know one was like a, a little nine, year, a nine, six year old boy, I believe it was, Lisa, that they're, that they're aware of. And, and so to donate her organs, Lyra's. And so her life will be able to go on in a certain manner to help be a blessing and help others out. But pray for Sandra, pray for Lyra's family, her mom, dad, and brothers and sisters. Very tough time for them, so remember them. Somebody else have a prayer request this morning, anybody? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Phyllis's niece passed away, and they were close like sisters, only a couple of years difference in their ages. And so 
So I can lose an assist. All right, Joe. Amen. Let's do pray, pray God's comfort. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. Difficult to be able to put your mind around things like that, isn't it? Yes. That's an ant. Yeah, okay. Let's ant symbol. Okay. Somebody else? All right. Margie's brother. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, Nancy. We sure do. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray for revival of America. Amen. Everybody can get on board with that. Anything else now before we pray, we take all these requests and just lay them at the feet of Jesus this morning. Anything else? Then let's do pray and ask God's blessing and anointing on each one of these requests. Let's just take a moment silently and, and you can lift your hearts to the Lord in prayer or pray audibly, silently, however. Then I'll call on somebody in just a minute. Brother Walt, would you lead us in prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this another time that we have this morning for us to be here for the service. As we encourage the pastor, dear Heavenly Father, to bless the brother while he's leading worship. And I pray for each request this morning, dear Heavenly Father, that you know. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the simple people who want your best and family. As we encourage them as only you can, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, have your way in our service. Help us back there at the name of Christ and all that we do for your precious name. Thank you, Lord, for all that you bless us with. Help us to be faithful, dear Heavenly Father, in these times of trouble. Lord, we know, Heavenly Father, that you control all things. Yes. Help us to bless now in our service. Bless us singing in all that we do. In Jesus' name. We normally try to let you remain seated at this song, but I think you, it's almost like our national anthem in Christianity, and it's called Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Let's stand today and sing it together, would you? Amazing Grace, as the duet leads us.
Let's do let's let the musicians get us started and then drop out and let's sing that last stanza a cappella. We could do that. Think about it. When we've been there, ten thousand years bright, shining as the sun. No less days to sing God's praise than when we just got started, because there'll be no clocks, there'll be no calendars, there'll be no years to even count off. We thank the Lord for that. At eternity with the Lord who saved us, loved us above all. So let's sing this last stanza and then as the instruments drop out, we'll do it a cappella, okay? When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first. singing over me You have been so so good to me For I took a breath You breathe your life in me You have been so so serve it still you give yourself away of the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God when I was your foe still your love fought for me you have been so so good
of God. Amen. Thank you, Adam and Ashley, this morning. If you have your Bibles, and we'll turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to go to chapter number 5, the very last chapter, and almost the last verse. Down on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you have the Schofield Reference Bible, we're on page 1270. Been in a series of lessons on the subject of standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. This is the third over 60 years ago, a fellow by the name of Everett Storms decided he was going to count all of the promises in the Bible. So he started out in Genesis chapter 1, went all the way through the book of Revelation, a little over two years it took him. And he'd come to the conclusion there's 7,487 promises. Now he might have missed one, who knows. But let's just say there's a whole bunch, right? Whatever how many there are, you can rest assured that God is good for every single one. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, that God is not slack concerning His promise, as some men would count slackness, but is patient. And the word here is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that how many should come to repentance? Not just a select few, right? But that all would come to to repentance. But God isn't slack concerning His promises. No sorry. The word slack means slow or late concerning His promises. And then Paul writing to Titus in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 says this, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot do what? Let's say those three words together. That cannot lie. One more time. That cannot lie. I want to drive that home. Promised before the world even began. God's promise of eternal life to his creation. You think about it. When Solomon dedicated the beautiful temple over in 1 Kings, he reminded the Israelite people that not one word has ever failed of all of the good promises of God. Not one of them. Not one of them. So I think today, especially in the day and age we live in, it's good to go back and study the promises of God. And we need to cling to them and stand on them and believe in them. You see, one thing, they give us faith to believe in the darkness that we're experiencing around the world. They give us guidance to take the very next step when sometimes it seems pretty cloudy or pretty dangerous. The promises of God, ladies and gentlemen, will help us gain strength to keep going when we really feel like giving up. Now, you can let your halos down this morning. Every one of us have been there at some point or another. We've been tempted to just throw up our hands and give up. But that's what we need to get in the book and start hanging on and standing on the promises of God. Notice with me, we'll read these two uh, text verses this morning that have a few things to teach about them. Verse number 23, and the very God of peace. Notice the next three words. We're going to be talking about it. Sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth yea you, who also will, say the next two, he'll do it. God's going to do what he said he'd do. I guarantee you, all 7,487, wherever how many there are, you can rest assured, God's going to do it. He's going to do exactly what he promised. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message and song this morning, the instrumentalists that have played so beautifully and the things that have done as we come today to worship you. 
Now, for the next few minutes, Lord, I just pray for the message, the, the lesson that needs to be driven home today to me and to those that are assembled and those that have joined us by means of the Internet today about this subject of sanctification as we stand on the promises of God. And think about it. Sometimes we just feel like it's a hopeless matter, but we can rest assured we will get better. I call your attention this morning to verse number 23 again, and I want you to think with me today about the person of the promise and the very God of peace, Paul said. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I'm going to talk about that setting. Don't let it scare you off. The doctrine of sanctification. I know there are denominations today built on that because they disagree with everybody else or whatever. But it's a very simple thing when you think about it. Sanctification. You see, uh, we can exercise the body and there's some benefit for that. You can tell I do a whole lot of that, can't you? And, well, you all do too, I'm telling you. Uh, we can go to therapy and that's good for the spirit or the soul. Uh, we can have friends that will lift us up and and that's kind of that's good also to have good friends that'll come along and encourage us. But ladies and gentlemen, you can have good fortune. You can come into a great inheritance. The publisher's clearinghouse can come by your door and leave you a multi-million dollar check or five thousand dollars a day for the rest of your life, or ever how that thing completes that they talk about. And that'll that'll go a ways to helping you get along better. But you know, only God can make us better, a better person. Starting in here, people have found it to be true who've been addicted to drugs and alcohol and various other things that when they came to God, God gave deliverance, He gave strength to overcome those things that just so, just so easily beset us. So think about it for just a moment. God is the author and the source of spiritual progress. He didn't just save us so He could write our name down in heaven's book of life, and that's great, absolutely, that's paramount probably. But He begins to do a work inside of us of what the Bible calls and refers to as sanctification. Big word, very simple concept. Let me think of it just for a moment. As we look at John chapter 15, verse number 5, I want you to think with me as the Lord says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But for without me you can do what, church? Nothing. Nothing. Without me, we've got to remember that He's the person of the promise today. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself, God the Father. Verse number 23. Second thing about it, if you'll notice with me today, is the purpose again. Look at verse 23 when He says, That I will sanctify you wholly, wholly, H-O-L-L-Y, completely. The word sanctify comes from a Greek word, hagiazo, and it means to be holy, to purify, to consecrate. What it means is this. You've been set apart when you come to Christ in faith. You've been set apart from sin to holiness. Now, we're not there yet. It's a process, see. It's an ongoing spiritual process to which God sets, uh, ladies and gentlemen, believers apart from sin, and He moves them toward holiness. It's a process gradually. I like the little song the children sung, and I always get this mixed up. But it says, I, he's still working on me. It made me what I ought to be. It took him six days to make the sun and stars, Jupiter and Mars and something and something else. How lovely and gracious is he. He's still working on me. And how true that is. He's still working on us. It's a, we are a work in progress. Sanctification is not an instantaneous thing like salvation is. But that process that God's working on us, knocking off the rough edges, taking some holy sandpaper out, and smoothing off some things in our life, ladies and gentlemen, to get us ready for heaven. That's called sanctification. It's a spiritual process by which God sets the believers apart from sin and He moves them toward holiness. God has ordained that His children, all of them, without exception, will be made complete. He's still working on me. I like what the old country preacher said in one of the sermons. He spoke about that sound. He said, you could hear it if you listen. The sound of hammering and sawing on the inside. When we finally get to heaven, he says, the hammers and the saws will be put away and we will stand before the Lord with every part in place and every aspect of our life made 
perfect. <laughs> See, we're not finished yet. I like the bumper sticker, be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. And how true that is. We're works in progress. Uh, we're not completely clean today, but we will be. It's a process. We're not wholly wise today, but we will be. We're not finished yet, but we will be. One commentator said this. He said, God intends the entire renovation of the man. You ever see those renovation shows on television? You know, Chip and, and Joanna and Flip and Flop and Mop and Sweep or something. How they renovate those buildings. They take these old dilapidated buildings and they're going to flip them or they're going to improve them. They're going to renovate them. And they get a budget set up. They can buy the property at a steal. And they figure for a certain amount of money, they got the budget there on the screen. They can do that renovation and knock out some windows and put in some French doors and move some walls and all that thing. But invariably, once they get dug into that, and some of you have been there, you know they always come up with a problem, don't they? And they tease you with it before a commercial break. Oh, uh, Chip, we get on the phone with Joanna. Joanna we got a problem here at this property. And then they'd cut away to a commercial and you had to wait till they come back to see what it was. And it probably was something like crack foundation or maybe there was mold in the basement or there was something they totally, the electrical wiring was not up to code or something that it was going to take X amount of dollars to fix it up. Renovation is costly. It's time consuming. It's expensive. And ladies and gentlemen of the day, God is renovating you and me that know Him as our personal Savior. You think with me just about, if you could change anything that you wanted to change, what would you change? See, renovation takes longer. It takes costs more. And it's not as easy as it looks. A job is tough that God only Himself could take charge of it and do it. He didn't delegate it out. He didn't tell the angels to do it. He doesn't tell one of the apostles to do it. It's something that God is doing in your life and in mine. Sanctification, renovation, if you want to call it that. That's the purpose. Then notice the prospect in verse 23. This is something else. Think about it. I pray you, God, your whole, notice here, spirit and soul and body be preserved how? Blameless. Now, blameless means nobody can accuse you of anything. You realize when we get to heaven, ladies and gentlemen, nobody will be able to accuse us of anything because we'll stand before God at that point perfect. <laughs> That's the process. He's getting us there. It's not instantaneous. It's a process. It's a promise of God. And so, folks, today, the prospect is our spirit, soul, and body. Man is a trinity, just like God is God the Spirit, God the Son, God the Father, and three and yet one, we are a trinity, body, soul, and spirit. And Paul's praying here that, it, that all, the complete man, the clean, complete woman, be preserved blameless. Nobody can point out anything in our life and so we get to heaven and say, oh, but you've got this issue. I noticed this about you. You're not perfect. No, nobody will be able to say that, ladies and gentlemen, today. So that's the prospect. We're going to change, folks. We are going to get better. God has something better in store for us. That's the promise today. Change anything about yourself on the inside, what would you change? Maybe you have a judgmental spirit that needs to be changed and dealt with. Maybe you have a critical tongue about talking about other people. Maybe you're caught up in envy of somebody, which leads to covetousness, and then that needs to be changed. What is it on the inside? What about it? Resentment? Maybe you have an ungrateful spirit. Here we are at Thanksgiving, but you have an ungrateful spirit about you. And what, a, what else might it be? Maybe you've got a quick temper. Maybe someone today has a guilty conscience, and God is working on the inside. You could hear the hammers and saws if you just listen. He's making us uh, to present us to the Father one day as the bride of Christ without spot, and without blemish. That's the prospect we have. That's the promise, ladies and gentlemen. Verse number 24 says, you can think with me about this, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. That's the promise. Our hope both in this life and in the life to come rests on one thing, the faithfulness of God. Faithful is he who called you. He will 
Do it. No ifs, ands, or buts. No maybes. No, well, if I get around to that, I'm busy over here, I'll do that. No, no, no. God will do exactly what He said in this process of getting us ready to be perfect one day after a while. But hey, you may know somebody who thinks they're already there. I got news for you. That's called pride, and it's a sin. And they're not there yet. Now, some folks, I tell folks all the time that we're all cut out of the same mold. Now, some of us are moldier than others. I understand. But we all have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are no perfect people. That the Bible teaches us very, very, very pointedly that our sins is what sends us to hell to pay for them. But Jesus Christ loved us so much that He came and He died on the cross. He paid this ultimate sacrifice for our sins that we could have a place in heaven because God's justice has been satisfied. Our sins have been paid for with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And folks, that begins a work then. God's in the process. Once we come to Him, He'll instantaneously save you, come into your life and into your heart. If you will put your faith and trust in Him and what He did at the cross, He'll take you up on it. He earnestly desires that all come to repentance and that none perish. And that's another promise of God. I guarantee you that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Say it again. That's a pretty word. Say it one more time. Saved. Amen. No ifs, ands, or buts. Not maybe. He will, if we'll call upon Him, take Him at His word, put our trust in Him and what He did at the cross, we could be assured of heaven as if we were already there today. Our hope, both in this life and in the life to come, folks, rests on the promise of God of His faithfulness in this sanctification process, the salvation process. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. And He's still working on you. God, uh, folks, we are a work in progress. We're all under construction. Romans 8, 29 says this. For whom He did foreknow, He did predestinate, now don't jump off the boat here, to be what? Conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, biblical predestination is those that have put their faith and trust in Christ, those that have been born again, those that have surrendered their all to Christ, are predetermined by Him, predestined to be conformed to what? The image of His Son. One day we're going to stand before God like Jesus is. Just like Him. We're being conformed to His image. That's that process we're talking about. That sanctification process. Paul talked about it in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 5 when he said, being confident of this very thing. Being confident that He which hath begun a good work in you, He's writing to save people. Listen to me. He's writing to save people. He that begun a good work in you will. He's faithful. He's dependable. He, you can count on Him. He will perform it until when? The day of Jesus Christ. And so He's good for His Word. You can stand on the promise. You've been troubled by some temptation that just trips you up so easily, some sin that doth so easily beset you. God is working on that. You help Him. You do all you can do from your standpoint. And then you can hear the saws, the hammer, the sandpaper getting you ready for heaven. Sanctification, it's called. There's hope for us. You will get better. Now, construction is long. It's loud. It's noisy. It's very messy sometimes. So that's why most of us hear those hammering and sawing on the inside. But like the old preacher said, we get to heaven, we can lay the hammers and the saws down. We'll stand before Him in the very image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Boy, that ought to light your fire this morning. You know it? You, you, you think about how you get tripped up easily, and, but God's not through with you yet. I, I counsel with people all the time who just beat themselves up over their sin. Now, they need to be concerned. They need to confess it and repent of it. Absolutely. Tell God you're sorry. Turn away from it. But quit beating yourself up on it. They're no perfect people. And we're all works in progress. And some of you are letting something you did years ago destroy your fellowship with God, destroy the joy of your salvation, destroy the fellowship that you could have with other Christians, you're hung up on the past sins that God 
has already forgiven. They're under the blood of Jesus Christ. Quit dragging them up. I told a dear saint recently. I said, she, she thought maybe the trouble she is going through, that God was punishing her for her sins. I said, let me tell you something. If you've brought them to Jesus, they're under the blood of Him. He punished Christ at the cross for your sins. He doesn't punish a Christian for his sins. Now, He corrects His kids. He disciplines His kids, absolutely. If we go on so headstrong like a spoiled brat and we just keep doing things we want not to do, God will discipline us. But I'm telling you, He doesn't punish us for our sins. He punished Jesus at the cross who took all of our sins upon Himself and died for us and they're marked in heaven's books, paid in full. And God doesn't punish us for them. He punished Christ. But with this sanctification process, sometimes He has to knock off some rough edges, doesn't He? Sometimes He has to allow us to go through some tough times to help straighten us out and fly right. My mama used to say to me all the time, you better straighten up and fly right or I'll bring you down a couple of notches, young man. Now, you all have trouble believing that, don't you, that I was ever needed, deserving of that. But every now and then, God has to say to us, now, straighten up and fly right, or I'm going to have to bring you down and let circumstances come into your life that I've been holding back to get you to straighten up and do the right thing. But ladies and gentlemen today, He's still working on us. It's sanctification. It's a process by which God will one day present us holy, H-O-L-Y, before the Son and the Father in a place called heaven. That's the promise I'm standing on today. God's not finished. He's still working on me. And I will one day, you're looking at a guy that one day will be perfect. I'm not there yet, and neither are you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for all 7,487, or ever how many, Lord, that you have in there that we might have overlooked. And I'm asking you today, Lord, as we bow for this moment of invitation, and we sing an invitation we hymn this morning, the Lord. I'm praying for those that have been struggling under a load of guilt. Some have got that besetting sin that just so does easily beset them, trip them up, cause them problems. May they trust you to take care of that, put it in your hands, and then move on and let you do the work of sanctification in their heart and in their life. I'm asking you today, Father, that you help them to come to Christ. And Lord, my prayer also is for that one that may not be prepared to face eternity. May this be the hour of the day that they will turn to you before it's everlasting too late. We ask that you give an invitation. Speak to that one there by the computer screen or their iPod or iPad. Speak, Lord, we pray to those that are assembled here on this Sunday morning. I'm asking you have your way in every single life today. And we ask it in Jesus' sweet, holy, precious name. Our heads are bowed for just a few minutes here. Adam's going to sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. Our altar of prayer is open. You can still socially distance and come to the altar if you'd like. Or if you want to pray right there where you're sitting and say, Lord, I realize now that you're working on me. You're getting me ready one day to be perfect. I'm not there yet, but help me with. And you fill in the blank. Lord, help me with the temper. Lord, help me with covetousness. Help me with lust. Help me with a critical attitude. Help me, Lord, be what you would have me to be. I'm trusting in you in this process called sanctification. What about it this morning? still before you, Lord.
Thank you this morning for coming out. Thank you for your attention, your prayers. We hope you have a great Thanksgiving week. There'll be no services here on Wednesday, none of the other ministries that we're doing on Wednesday night. This week, it's uh, Thanksgiving Eve, Wednesday is. And, you know, some of us are just going to cook and bake and get all that stuff ready. And, you know, and some of it, you all get to eat it. So, I mean, on Thanksgiving, I hope that you have a great Thanksgiving day this week. So I, I will remind you something. It's been about eight months now in COVID. If we get, tend to forget sometimes, please remember the social distancing, not to congregate in the foyers. There are hand sanitizers on the exit, the exits as you leave, and a few are here throughout the auditorium. Please feel free to use those to wear a mask if you'd like. Uh, we have people that will say they won't come because they're afraid to be embarrassed. Put a mask on. Well, don't be. Don't be at all. And so you feel free to do that. And if you want to gather and talk, please, outside there, do that. But keep the six foot. And we do appreciate you. We've been very fortunate at Victory, very fortunate. And some churches have had to shut back down after they opened up because of the outbreak within the church family. And we've not had to do that. And I praise God for it and for you being very cautious and very careful. Uh, any other announcements? Anything, Lisa, that I've forgotten? Or? recuperating on Friday, right? <laughs> Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer this morning. Goodness, I'm so glad you're here today. Do you remember the prayer requests that have been shared with us a little bit earlier in the service? Brother Max Cronin, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Have a good day. I'll see you here, there, or in the air.